You know, I, I, before we get started with our message, I have had so many people contacting. Hundreds of thousands of letters have poured in wanting me to tell more about Chuck Norris. <laughs> See, some people speak a foreign language. Some of you do. Chuck Norris can speak Braille. Once a cobra bit Chuck Norris's leg, and after five days of excruciating pain, the cobra died. <laughs> Many people are afraid of the dark. The dark is afraid of Chuck Norris. Here's one. Chuck Norris can tie his shoes with his feet <laughs> while his feet are already in the shoes. There's never been a hurricane named Chuck, and rightfully so because it would have destroyed everything. Chuck Norris is the reason why Waldo is hiding. I was always wondering. I always wondered about that. Chuck Norris doesn't wear a watch. He decides what time it is. Chuck Norris doesn't get frostbite. Chuck Norris bites frost. And this is my favorite. COVID-19 will be getting the Chuck Norris vaccine as soon as it's available. So there you have it. Get your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. David, we're getting a hum up here. 1 Peter chapter 4. Have you noticed in our society, we've become more and more adept at changing and using other words other than sin? Just don't want to call sin, sin. We, we'll, we'll say there are accidents, mistakes, errors in judgment. We'll, we'll, you know, the world will say all kinds of things. Just don't want to call it sin. And then we change words and phrases, different types of sin. Uh, the modern world calls it stretching the truth. The Bible calls it the sin of lying. And the Bible says in Proverbs 12, 22, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. Sounds serious to me. We call, or the world calls it living together or hooking up. The Bible calls it the sin of fornication. Uh, the world will call it having an affair. But the Bible calls it the sin of adultery. The world will call it the gay lifestyle. But the Bible calls it an abomination to God. It's as if we're just sort of playing around with sin. You know, like it's a game, like it's, uh, it's not serious. It's, and, uh, and yet it is very serious. Sin deceives, it destroys, it, it fascinates, and then it assassinates. It, it just thrills, and it does, and then it kills. So I want to talk to you about the storms of sin this morning because whether you know it or not, the storms of sin, and I know you do know it, the storms of sin are swirling around all the time. Like a, like a giant hurricane or tornado that's around all of us, it affects every one of us, the storms of sin. And so if you found your place, I want you to stand with me. First Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter 4. And look at verse 1. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in the lasciviousness, lust, Excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, abominable uh, idolatries, wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them in the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you, who shall give an account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. For for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. Thank you. you may be seated. If you're a Bible believer, then you know by faith hell is real. Amen. A lot of people don't want to admit hell is real. They'll say, I believe in heaven. I don't believe in hell. Well, then you don't believe in the Bible. You can't take part of it and leave the rest of it out. 
Hell is a real place. It's a literal place. It's a horrible place. It's a, plain of, a place of suffering and death, pain, fire, a falling. It's a place where the worm dieth not. It's a place of darkness. It's a place of separation. You do not want to go to hell. No one wants to go to hell. And you certainly should not wish that on your worst enemy. I certainly do not. I don't wish that on anyone. Hell, because I, I believe in hell. I believe it's real. I believe it's what the Bible says. And yet God did not primarily come to save us from hell. Did you know that? He came to save us from sin. The Bible says in, in Matthew 121, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. Now, if you're saved from sin, you're saved from hell. Amen? Amen. But if you're not saved from sin, you're not saved from hell. Galatians 3.22 says, The Scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Ephesians 2.1 says, You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Even though the storms of sin are constantly, constantly blowing all around us, we do not have to be controlled by the storms of sin. And that brings me to number one. I'm going to share with you five things. Number one, the storms of sin, they're present, but we don't have to be controlled by them. We do not have to be controlled by them. Look at verse one. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. Now, see the word for as much. It refers, I believe, to back to a verse in the previous chapter, in, verse, in chapter 3. Verse 18 says, Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. So there's a connection there, for as much since that happened. See, the Lord Jesus not only suffered for sins, he died for sins. Amen. And, uh, and so we see this connection. And then in verse 1, you're back in chapter 4, it says, arm yourselves. It means we're to arm ourselves like a, a military man would. When he's going into battle or going into war, he's going to be armed. He's going to have weaponry. He's going to have armament. He's going to have protection. And, and so he is going to, to be careful. And the Bible tells us in Ephesians 6 that we're to put on the whole armor of God. Spiritually speaking, put on the whole armor of God that we can stand in the evil day and that we can stand against the wiles of the devil. But God's method for dealing with sin, listen, is death. It's always death. Jesus died to overcome sin. And we are to put death to sin. The Bible says in Colossians 3, 5, mortify. That's not a word we use very often. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Mortify. It means make to die, put to death. We're to put to death. We're not just to shove them out of the way and try or ignore them. We are to put to death sin in our life. And we can do it because sin has no more control over us. You say, well, then why do we still sin? Because we allow it. We allow there to be sin in our life. But sin is not to have control over the Christian. See, the Lord defeated sin. And the death of the Lord Jesus Christ was, first of all, substitutionary. Look at verse 1 again. For as much then as Christ has suffered, now look what it says, for us. That's a substitutionary death. He didn't sin. You did. I did. And he died for us. Why? Because of our sin. Christ, and, and actually you can say it this way. Christ, this is a literal translation. Christ hath suffered instead of us. He suffered instead of us. That's a substitution. That's a doctrine of substitution. There's another doctrine we need to learn. And that is the doctrine of identification. See, he died for me and I died. I died with him. When we baptize someone, I'll usually say buried with him in baptism, raised to walk. In the, that means you died, you were buried, and you're raised to a new life 
in Christ Jesus. It's the doctrine of identification. When Jesus died, you died. And in a way, when he went to the cross, you went to the cross. You went with him. It's the doctrine of identification. And because he said, it is finished, you know what that means? That means he's done with sin. He's done with it. He's totally defeated it. He's totally conquered it. He's finished. He's finished. That's part of what that means. It is finished. I mean, the sin debt has been paid. Sin has been dealt with. Sin has been conquered. It's been defeated. The power of sin that nailed Jesus to the cross has no more power over him. But because it has no more power over him, it is not to have any more power over you and me. We are to totally be, uh, be able to conquer sin in our life. Three times, 1 Peter 2.24, 1 Peter 3.18, and 1 Peter 4.1, Peter says that it was in his flesh and in his body that Christ paid the penalty for man's sin. J. Vernon McGee said it this way, Christ did not die in sin, nor did he die under sin, but he died to sin. He took my place. He took your place. He paid the penalty for our sin. From that point on, Christ will not come back to die for sin. He will no longer have any relationship to sin because of the fact that he arose from the grave. And when he, came, when he rose, he came back in a glorified body. Christ conquered sin. He defeated sin. And so he will not deal with sin anymore. He don't have to. He's already defeated it totally, 100%. And so because of that, we too do not need to be controlled by sin. And I'm already leading into number two. The storms of sin have no more power over the Christian. Now, I want to be real clear about something this morning. The storms of sin that are swirling all around us, all of us, all the time, have power over lost people. So if you're here today and you're lost, you do not know Jesus Christ, you've never been born again, then you are not protected from the storms of sin. You just don't have that protection. And, and, and the Bible tells it in many different ways. First of all, the lost people are blinded by sin. And Satan does it. And so they're blind and they don't even understand what's wrong with it. I don't see anything wrong. They're blind. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, 3, and 4, If our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, and whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine unto them. Not only are they blinded, but there's, they're in bondage. <clears throat> they may not know it, and they don't, but they're in bondage. By the way, we all were blinded at some point, and we all have been in bondage to sin. Hopefully, you're no longer in bondage to sin. Uh, if, if you think you are, it's just because you, you don't understand what you have in Jesus Christ. If you've been saved, there is no more bondage to sin. And the Bible commands us, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty. That's the freedom wherewith Christ hath made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Would the Lord tell us that if, there's a, if, if, if uh, we just automatically could never be in bondage again? No, he says, don't go get in bondage again. See, we can allow sin to have control in our life. We can allow sin to have power in our life. But there's no sense in it. There's no need in it. Because the Lord Jesus conquered sin. But the lost people, they're... they're not only in bondage and blinded, they're defeated by sin. They're even destroyed by sin. I think of the verse, then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth what? Death. Death. That's the lost person. That's not the saved person. Write this verse down in your, in your notes there. Galatians 2.20. This really describes some of what I'm trying to get across. Galatians 2.20, it says this, I am crucified with Christ. Doctrine of identification. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What a verse. The doctrine of substitution and the doctrine of identification. What does all that mean? It means the devil doesn't have any more power over us. 
Sin does not have any more power over us. The devil doesn't have control over us. Look at verse 2. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. Isn't that something? You do not have to live your life in bondage and in sin ever, ever again. Now, we do sometimes, but we shouldn't because God has conquered sin. I heard a story in a newspaper that was, it took place in South Africa. And a woman was passing a haystack, and, and she sees the tail of a snake just sort of sticking out. She decides she's going to have some fun. So she got a long stick, and she hit the tail of that snake. She's thinking it's going to scurry right on under that haystack. In about two minutes, she was fighting for her life with a 17-foot python. And she started screaming and yelling. A man heard. He, he, he ran to see what was wrong. He saw what was happening. He got a fence post and killed the snake. And the paper recorded that if he had not come, that snake would have crushed her to death in a few moments. See, that's the way we are with sin. We think our little sin, it's no big deal. It's the tail of the snake. There's no such thing as little sins. Did you know that? Sin is sin. It's not to be played with, not to be joked about. According to the National Survey on Drug Use, many drug addicts begin just with a little tobacco or, a, or, or just a little drink here and there. A little bit of marijuana. Next thing you know, fast forward a little bit and they're hardcore drug addicts or drunkards. That's the way it works. It deceives. It destroys. Sinful life's a wasted life, wicked life, a warped life. The storm of sin have no control over us. The storms of sin have no more power over us. But number three, the storms of sin cause the lost people to think we're strange. You know what, church? You're strange. That's what the lost people think. You're strange. You're weird. I can look at you and tell some of you. Are. <laughs> verse 4. Look at verse 4. Wherein they think it's strange that ye run not with them in the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. People think that separated, sold-out Christians that go to church all the time, that read the Bible and pray, are just weird. Man, you waste so much time. We go out and have some fun on Sunday. And you got to go to church? Come on. Why don't you ever party with us anymore? Why don't you ever go? Why don't you go drinking anymore? Man, we used to have so much fun. Remember the days. Man, come on. You don't ever, you don't ever try the dope anymore. What's the matter with you? You're wasting. Th- you see the word excess in verse 4? It has the idea of something that's running over and just flowing like into a ditch or, or into a gutter. In this case, it's the filthiness of sin. The filthiness of sin is just running over down into the gutter. The excess of riot. You see the word riot? In the Greek, the word means wasted. Waste. So it's like this. The filthiness of flesh in some people's lives is just overflowing, running down into the gutter, leading to a wasted life. That's what that literally means. And that's where so many people, and yet they think we're strange. We all know people who fit that category. Their life is just, they're, they're mixed up in the filthiness of the flesh, and their life just leads to a waste, a wasted life. Down in the gutter, literally. How sad that is. And they think we're strange. It reminds me of a guy that went to a psychiatrist's office. And the, the receptionist told him, go in there and have a seat. So he goes in there and he sits. And then here comes a psychiatrist. He hadn't even looked at him. He sits there. And, and when he looks up, he sees this guy's got a slab of bacon over one ear. And a slab of bacon over the other end. And a fried egg on top of his head. And you know how psychiatrists are. He, he sits there. And, and he's facing this guy. And he's just looking at him contemplating and finally he says 
What seems to be the problem? And the guy says, oh, I don't have a problem. I'm here to talk about my brother. I think something's wrong with him. (laughs) I think anyone who does not repent of sin and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and receive eternal life, the free gift of eternal life, I think they are a few bricks short of a full load. I mean, a few sandwiches short of a picnic. I think they're weird. I think they're strange. I feel sorry for them. And yet we're strange and we're peculiar people. Look at verse 4. The storms of sin are blowing. They're swirling. But they are defeated by the gospel. What is the gospel? That's the glorious news that Jesus died. And he was buried and he rose again for you. He died for you. And then he offers this free gift. God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son. That if you will just put your faith and trust in Christ, he'll give you eternal life. He'll forgive you of your sins. That's the gospel. The glorious gospel of Christ. And the power of sin has been broken in your life. We no longer need to be controlled by sin. Are corrupted by sin or condemned by sin last week last Sunday afternoon my message was bad news good news and the bad news we're all under condemnation we're all condemned by sin that's the bad news John 3 19 this is the condemnation light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light why because their deeds are evil You know why people won't turn to Christ? They love their sin. That's the bottom line. When they hear the gospel and they will not repent and turn, they just love their sin. Why? Because their deeds are evil. They'll not. They'll ignore the light. They'll run from the light because their deeds are evil. That's the condemnation. But praise the Lord for Romans 8, 1. It says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. We're not condemned. Praise his name. Now look at verse 5. It says, Who shall give an account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? Now the quick and the dead. The quick is the living. The living and the dead. God is saying there is a day of reckoning coming. He's going to judge the quick or the living and the dead. And we need to remember that this is referring to people who were persecuted I mean, people who were persecuting the people of God. And for those people who've been persecuting Christians, there's a day of reckoning, a judgment. It's coming. It's real. It's a day of reckoning. And it's coming for all the lost. But verse 6 tells us something else. There's a day of recognition coming also. And that's for the saved. Verse 6 says, For for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. Now, did you notice that? You say, well, Pastor, does that mean that people get a second chance after they die? It says right here that there were... Let's read it again. For for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. So they, they get a second chance. The gospel's preached again to them. No, look at it more carefully. It says, for for this cause was the gospel preached. Do you see it? That's past tense. When was the gospel preached to those people who are dead? When they were alive, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's when it was. And so these people have been judged by people on the earth. It says, men judged them in the flesh. Verse 6, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh. The men in the flesh say, you're weird, Christian. You're strange. You're peculiar, Christian. Christian, you're a pig. You need to be put to death. That's what's going on in many countries in the world today. And they're putting Christians to death. They call them pigs. They look at at Christians as if they're animals to be killed. And they're doing it. But there's a day of reckoning coming for them. These people... 
had the gospel preached to them, and they believed. They believed, and they're saved. These are Christians. Now they're in heaven. So there's a day of recognition for them. That's why we need to know Matthew 10, 28. It says, and fear not them which kill the body. I just told you it's happening in other countries. It could happen here in America. And it could be, it could be sooner than we think that Christians are persecuted and even put to death. But the Bible's clear. Jesus is the one who said this. Matthew 10, 28, and fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. I said this last week, I believe. Here's, here's the biggest problem that I know in America right now. There's no fear of God. That's the problem. They don't fear God. You better fear God. That doesn't mean we're supposed to be scared that we're not even going to talk to him. Or follow him or obey him. But it's a holy fear that we reverence him so much. We're certainly not going to take his name in vain. Amen? Amen. Amen. Don't throw around OMG. How wicked is that? He's the one that gave you life. Ray Comfort also often asks this. He says, would you take your mom's, your mother's name uh, in vain? Would you use her name as a cuss word? And people say, no. Why not? Because I love her. Well, he's the one who gave you life. And you're going to throw his name around as a curse word? Serious. And the last one is number five. The storms of sin are swirling, but they are overcome. Here's, this is good, in Jesus. He's the key. They're overcome in Jesus. I want you to turn one more scripture. Turn to 1 Corinthians, please. I want to show you. Just a few verses as we close. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This message should be an encouragement if you're a Christian. Sin doesn't control you. It doesn't have power over you. And they call you strange and weird and peculiar. That's okay. It ought to be encouraging to you. 1 Corinthians 15. This ought to be encouraging to you. Look at verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all, asl all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. First Peter 2, Christians are described as a peculiar people. Let me tell you who, if you're peculiar, if you're saved, you're peculiar. I already told you that. You know who you're not peculiar to? The Lord. You're not peculiar to the Lord. And I'll tell you something else. You're not peculiar to other Christians. Amen. Years ago, a Christian was brought before an emperor. The emperor told the Christian, if you don't recant your faith, I'll throw you in prison. The Christian replied, then I'll have a whole new group of people to preach to. <laughs> right. He said, then I'll kill you. He said, but I have eternal life. I have eternal life in Jesus Christ. The emperor said, well, then I'll have you tortured. He said, well, then I'll be following the steps of my Lord. They tortured him too. And in the process, he redeemed mankind. The emperor said, well, I'll condemn you to slavery. He said, oh, I'm already a slave to Christ. And then the emperor said, then I'll burn you at the stake. And the Christian said, you threaten me with flames that will burn for but a moment. But you, sir, are facing hell. The flames forever. A little while later, this emperor let that Christian go. And he turned to somebody and said, what do you do with a guy like that? A 
Look at verse 55. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of, sin, of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you have victory, church? Do you have victory? It only comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only one that can give you victory. Have you put sin to death in your life? You say, well, I still sin. Well, if you, if you sin, you immediately confess it. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But don't stay in sin. You can have a thought that comes to your mind and you know that's not right. You immediately confess it. Lord, I'm sorry. I'm so you know, I have to do that a lot. I'll just be transparent with you. I have to do that a lot. Just thoughts there. That's not right, Lord. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I don't want that in my life. The victory is in Jesus. You may be here today and you don't know the Lord Jesus. You've never been born again. Jesus said you must be born again. If you haven't been, would you get saved today? If you need some more information, you need someone to talk to you, pray with you, I'll be here in the front in just a moment. We're going to have a hymn of invitation. I invite you to come. Please don't leave this place if you're lost. If you don't know for sure you would go to heaven if you died today, please don't leave this place without talking to someone. Get that settled. If there's sin in your life, if there's something that's got some sort of control or bondage in your life, please forsake that. Confess it. Forsake it. Turn away. Repent. Let's all stand. Father, we just turn this invitation time over to you. We thank you, Lord, that sin has no control over us. The storms of sin have no power over us. I just pray, Father, that you'd help us all to get right with you in our lives. And if there, again, if there's one lost, I pray they'll get saved even right now. If there's some other decision that needs to be made, I pray it'll be made now. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Won't you come?